Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, What Do Business Students Want in Today's College Classroom? Perspectives from both small and large classroom instructors. My name is Jennifer Haldeman, and I'm a product marketing manager here with Sage Publishing. Let me begin by introducing you to our speakers. Professor Heidi Neck and Professor Chris Neck, our brother-sister author duo. Heidi Neck is the Jeffrey Timmons Professor of Entrepreneurial Studies at Babson College. She's been recognized by international organizations, the Academy of Management, and USASB for excellence in pedagogy and course design. Uh, for pushing the frontiers of entrepreneurship in higher education, she was awarded Entrepreneurship Educator of the Year in 2016 by the Schultz Foundation, and then again by USASB in 2022. Heidi is the Academic Director uh, of the Babson Academy, a dedicated unit within Babson that inspires change in the way university faculty teach entrepreneurship. She's also the Faculty Director of Babson's Symposia for Entrepreneurship entrepreneurship educators programs designed to further develop faculty from around the world in the art and craft of teaching entrepreneurship. And Heidi has personally directly trained over 4,000 faculty around the world. She believes how we teach is just as important as what we teach. She speaks and teaches internationally on cultivating the entrepreneurial mindset and espousing the positive force of entrepreneurship in a societal change agent. In addition to her academic responsibilities, she's a consultant, entrepreneur, board member, and investor. And Dr. Christopher Neck is currently an associate professor of management at Arizona State University, where he held the title University Master Teacher. From 1994 to 2009, he was part of the Pamplin College of Business faculty at Virginia Tech. He received his PhD in management from Arizona State University and his MBA from Louisiana State. Uh, Chris is author and or co-author of 27 books and 125 articles in seminal management journals. Chris has taught over 70,000 students during his career in higher education and currently teaches a mega section of management principles to approximately 1,000 students each semester at Arizona State University. Chris was recently voted as a semifinalist out of 140 nominations for the prestigious International 2020 Baylor University Cherry Award for Great Teaching. He finished in the top six of all nominations. Chris was also the recipient of the 2007 Business Week Favorite Professor Award. He's featured on businessweek.com as one of the approximately 20 professors from across the world receiving this award. So before we fully get started, I want to let you know that this one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We'll be sending out a link to view it and access any slides or materials that are shown or referenced to all registrants in the coming days. And without further ado, I am extremely excited to turn it over to Professors Heidi and Chris Neck. Thank you, Jim. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, Heidi, how you doing? I'm excited to be here. I'm, well, thank know. you, everybody, for showing up. Totally. I hope we have a good number on here. It's hard to it's hard to know how many are, are on here. So I would like to welcome everyone um, to the webinar. When Sage contacted Chris and me about doing this webinar, Chris and I got on the phone and was like, what do we want to talk about? And we both immediately agreed, Chris, right, that we were going to talk about how what students want in today's classroom. Absolutely. So we immediately said, all right, let's just take a couple of minutes on our own and write down what we think students really want in today's classroom. And believe it or not, and no joke here, we came up with just about the exact same list. Right, Chris? Well, and Heidi, I think we need to add the unique thing is uh, Heidi teaches smaller classes, uh, less than 40, would you say, Heidi? Yeah. And I yeah. And I teach classes every semester of greater than 500, usually 1,000. And so given that we teach different size classes, we still had a very similar list, which I thought was very, very unique. Yeah, so here's the big reveal. Um, we decided that kind of the top five things that we are seeing that students, whether large or in small classes, need today is relevance, inspiration, and connection fairness, the entrepreneurial mindset, regardless of discipline, and certainly last but not least, fun. 
So Chris and I are going to go back and forth and kind of riff off of one another in terms of each of these five things. So Chris, let's start with you, because I know based on our conversations, relevance is so big in your teaching world. So what does it mean for you and how do you how do you do that? Heidi, uh, I, I'm happy to, to start off. To me and, and everyone in the webinar, relevance is showing our students or showing my students in terms of my, my perspective that the material that we discuss is useful to their lives, not only five, 10 years from now when they're running businesses, but today. I mean, today. I mean, I want them when they come to each class to say, I'm going to learn something that's going to impact my life today. And so, and, and it's very easy for me. I primarily teach principles of management. And to me, every single concept in principles of management relate help uh, relates to what students or students can apply those concepts today. So let me give you an example. I know everyone's saying, okay, give me an example. Well, let's say I'm talking about communication in, in, in class. So I'll start off, I'll spend the first three to five minutes I'll define the the concept. So in this case, communication. But in then I'll say, okay, well, I'll tell the students point blank. This is why you should listen today. Not not because it's going to be on the exam. And when I say relevance, I'm not talking about the exam. I'm talking about bigger picture. So I'll first show them a, or discuss a study regarding communication that shows the amount of money in the billions that companies lose every year due to poor communication. Several studies show that. And then I'll say, okay, well, maybe you're a business major, but you could care less about uh, being a CEO one day. So then I'll take it out of, out of the business realm and I'll show them a study from, a, from the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy that shows that long-term successful intimate relationships, the number one factor that, that couples suggest leads to their successful relationship is communication. So when, why would not why would someone not want to listen to given the relevance there? Does that make sense, Heidi? I totally, Chris. And just as an aside for the audience, like like I'm gonna kind of open your closet. Chris and his wife have like the best communication. Everyone in the family is like jealous of Chris and Jennifer because they communicate so well. I think Chris, for me also, um, relevance is. Well, let's put it this way. In today's business world and in higher education and in business schools, and again, I teach entrepreneurship only, but even across all disciplines, I think content is a commodity today. So just about anything that people want, they probably can get online free. So the best analogy that I can come up with is, let's just say I wanna find the lyrics to my favorite song. and. And my favorite song is Landslide, the Stevie Nicks version. And if I want to Google the lyrics, I quickly type in Stevie Nicks, Landslide, and poof, the lyrics come up right there. But that does not mean I know how to sing. And that also doesn't mean that I'm getting the emotional feeling that I would get if I actually listened to the song. And I think that's our role as educators in terms of making the content sing for the students, helping the students sing. Um, that's what I believe. And if we can do that, we maintain not only the relevance of the content, but our own relevance as well. Heidi, I, I love I love that. I make I mean, I love the idea of print the lyrics from a song and read them you're not going to get the same emotional reaction as listening to uh, a song, a landslide song. I know that's your favorite song. And I tell you, that's to me, teaching is, is trying to evoke that emotional reaction. So we're, we're on the same page. So given, given I'm talking, Heidi, let's go on to the second one. Heidi, tell me, uh, what do you mean by inspiration and connectedness in the classroom? I think, you know, it actually connects to the last comment that you just made. You can't have learning without emotion. And I think as educators, we need to inspire our students to engage in some way. And I think we often accomplish inspiration by curating very emotional experiences where the students not only act, but they feel at the same time. Connection has two different things for me, Chris. 
I want to make sure that I develop a connection with students. But even more importantly, I want the students in the classroom to have connections, real connections with one another. I think we often assume students in a business school, they're taking classes together. They may know one another. I think they may know one another in passing, but do they really know them well enough to help build a learning community? So I think that's important. So my authenticity connecting with the students and the students' authenticity connecting with one another. I recently came across, uh, it was it's headlines everywhere, like this big study on happiness. And the one thing that separates happy people from unhappy people are relationships. And I don't think the things that we cultivate online through the dating apps or social media, I don't think those are relationships that necessarily lead to happiness. It's the physicality of coming together in a space that really does that. And so the question may be from those on the webinars, how do you actually do inspiration and how do you actually build connection in the classroom? And I think it's a series of things. It just doesn't happen on day one. It just doesn't happen on day two. It's how you build that over time. There's two things I want to share with you that may help some of those on the webinar, Chris. And one is I have an open letter that I send to students via email five days prior to the start of the class. I just say, please read this part. I don't put it on Canvas or Blackboard. I email it directly to them. And it's just, it's, it's an, a letter that really, and I'm happy to share this post webinar. Um, it's a letter that basically says, this is my philosophy on teaching. And this is kind of what I expect from you. And if you do this and I do this, we're gonna have a wonderful time together. And so it really sets the stage. The second thing, I teach a lot about entrepreneurial mindset and I send out mindset vitamins every day via text to my students. And they don't, they don't, I don't want them to respond. I just want them to take the vitamin. And you may be saying, what the what is the vitamin, Heidi? It could be a quote, it could be a reminder, it could be an action that I want them to do, like walk to class differently. It's just something that they take every day of the semester from day one until our final class day, including weekends. They will get a mindset vitamin for me. And that's how I stay connected to them. What about I, you, Chris? I'm going to stop no, talking. I'm just, that's hard to follow. Um, uh, you know, I, you had to follow me our whole lives as your, as your big brother. So I, guess <laughs> I am, the audience should know, Chris, I'm the younger one. I am yeah. the young, I am and the, the audience should know both of my parents, may they rest in peace that Heidi was the favorite. Uh, I'm still dealing with that. Um, but it's inspiration and connectiveness, Heidi. Um, that's that's my that's the foundation. If I had to put a foundation of these five elements for my teaching uh, and, and everyone in the webinar, this would be it. And, and I lump both of those into the word classroom culture. You know, when we talk about organizational culture, we talk about the personality of the organization. What, ha what, what happens in that organization to make it that organization? And so I view my classroom as an organization and I try to create an organizational culture that inspires and where students feel connected, where they wanna come. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, knock on, knock on wood, but I teach really large classes and I, I have really, really good attendance and I'm very fortunate for that. But let me let me share with you some of the things that I do, like Heidi said, in terms of to create that. On the on the very first day, I show up in the uh, in the in the front of the entire classroom, large auditorium, and I put on a mask, not a COVID mask, but uh, um, it's a Mardi Gras mask. Heidi and I are from Louisiana, so Heidi will know what I'm talking about. And I stand in front of the class for a few seconds, or maybe 20 seconds, and then I take it off. Very with a lot of exaggeration. And, and then I, I tell the class, the reason why I did that is I want that, what I just did to symbolize what I want to happen in our class. And that is, we're a big class, lots of people. And it's very, very challenging and, and, and anxiety provoking to participate as a student. It's easy just to hide within the masses. And I said, I want you, when I ask, what's the point of this case or what's the point of this video or do you have an example of this theory i don't want you to hide behind the mask i want you to remove the mask and then i i if i if i'm going to ask them to do something i say if i'm going to ask you to do that i need to remove the mask and so on the first or second day of class i allow the students to interview me 
I take 20, 30 minutes, five minutes, however, whatever it takes. And I tell the students, you can ask me any question about anything, anything, the class, about me, my life, whatever you want to do. And, you know, as long as it's not making fun of someone, um, I'm going to answer that qu question. And that really sets the stage, Heidi, for bringing in the, the hey, you know, that professor's willing to open up. So we should, too. Some other things I do is I hey, Chris, give... Real quick, how much, how much time do you give for that Ask Me Anything? Uh, I go as many questions as they want. And sometimes that goes 20 to 30 minutes. It takes a it takes a large part of the class, but I think it's very important to set that stage, that culture. Very good question, Heidi. Another thing I do, I give all thousand students my personal cell phone. They can contact me 24-7 if they have an issue. And very, you know, it, they know they can reach out to me if they need to. I do I have a policy of no laptops in class that we're there. We don't do any mathematical equations. They don't need their laptops in class so that we're all focused on the material at hand. That way, when someone opens up their laptop and they're watching a YouTube video, they're not disturbing the other 30 people in their vicinity. And finally, Heidi, I read a poem that I have written at the end of every single class to close the class, to have part of our culture, to, to it. sometimes it relates to the material, sometimes it doesn't, but just things that I do to so that they know when they're in our class, that it's a special place, it's a different place. And, yeah, and that um, kind of creates a rhythm, I would imagine. They're, they're expecting it. Absolutely. So Heidi, I know I went on and on about, about inspiration connected, connectedness, but it's really the foundation of, of my classes. Let's go on the fairness. Heidi, how do you, you know, we throw that up as fairness and we both wrote that down. And I think we see it very similarly. Why don't you tell the, the 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 webinar audience what you mean by fairness and how you execute that in your class? Well, I think I'd like to start with you on that one, Chris, because you've got the big thousand. You know, now I understand why you're not returning my text is because all your students are texting you because you give them your cell phone number. But no, it's because, I'd it's like because, to start off with the with the big classes on fairness. Well, but let me just add the reason I'm not off. responding to your text is because my wife and I are, are communicating so well. <laughs> um, but um, so fairness, Heidi, fairness and everyone out there, fairness to me. Uh, now, remind you, I have to remind you that I teach a thousand plus students every semester. So this may or may not apply to smaller classes, but fairness to me means everyone in the class is on the, is held to the same standards, the same level. They're all in the same level playing field. I do not deviate from my syllabus. It's very clear. I'd be happy to share my syllabus with anyone who wants to see it. Everyone knows they're held to the same standards. I don't, I don't want to be the judge and jury of whether Susie's excuse for missing the exam is different than, than, uh, uh, than Jennifer's uh, excuse for missing the exam. And if it don't get me wrong, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying lack of compassion, compassion Heidi. I don't think accountability means lack of compassion. It just means holding everyone accountable. And, you know, right after COVID, it was a little bit difficult because I think some standards were, you know, we, we let go of some standards from, from our standpoint with, from teaching, but I have no problem now. Student, I have students come to me, Heidi, and actually appreciate saying, thank you. I know that I'm going to be treated the same as anyone else in this class. And it just makes my job as teaching large classes easier. I can spend my time on developing the class and helping students and, and, and making the class a wonderful place. And I'm not spending 90% of my time dealing with administrative issues because I'm, I'm creating exceptions to half the class. Does that make sense, Heidi? It does. And I, you know, I think in a class of that size, you have to have those boundaries. I think you have to create that structure because there's too many people that can, you know, text you in the middle of the night asking for different leniences, you know, in a class of, you know, 50 or less, it's, you know, when I first started teaching, I've been at Babson. I know you're going to feel really old now, Chris. I've been at Babson for like 21 years. And when I first started and I was really young, you know, I was kind of that cool professor being the friend. I quickly learned that you should not be friends with your students because they tend to try to take advantage of you, ask for extra credit, turn things in late. 
So then the pendulum for me completely swung in the other direction where I was the complete disciplinarian. You know, they had to like sign that they read the syllabus and understood my class policies. And now as I've aged and also, you know, with age comes confidence in teaching and confidence in pushing back and confidence not to teach to the ratings. You know, the contract is definitely my syllabus. I'm struggling a little bit in this environment and I'm, I'm wondering if people listening are also struggling. You know, the mental health issues of our students is, you know, it's, it's, it's playing a role. And I feel like, I feel like I'm having a bit of low compassion fatigue, you know, because I want to acknowledge that they're willing to talk about all of their mental health issues or they need a mental health day or they can't turn something in on time. At the same time, I need to be fair to those that are turning things in on time. So I'm personally having a, a struggle right now, but I've always believed that it's better to be fair to the class than make the exception for, for one or a few. So uh, we're, we're on the same page, Heidi. And, and I just want to the, 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 uh, repeat what you said with the audience. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a delicate balance, but in order for, at least for me with large classes to survive, it's a no exceptions. Now, if there is a severe case, someone's really struggling. I'm fortunate at Arizona State University, we have programs, departments that I can say, hey, you need to go, re I suggest, I encourage you to go reach out to, to these folks for help, but I still have to hold you accountable. So we're, we're on the same page. Heidi, I'm excited about the next one uh, because I know this is, this is your expertise. Heidi is like the leading authority in terms of entrepreneurship teaching in the world and I don't say that because you're my sister. I say that because I'm reading the text you just sent me. Uh, but um, Heidi, tell us what you mean by entrepreneurship mindset. <laughs> well, I have, I have no response on the text thing right now. I'm just, I'm just laughing and I'm, I, I don't want to do a belly laugh and can, you know, go out of control. But yes, I'm, I'm certainly not the world's leading authority, but I'm probably one of the most passionate people about teaching the entrepreneurial mindset. You know, Chris and I have two books together, one introduction to entre or entrepreneurship, the practice and mindset, which is an intro to entrepreneurship book. And we have another textbook called intro to business. And in both of those books, we define entrepreneurship as a way of thinking, acting and being that combines the ability to create and, and identify opportunities with the courage to act on them. And that courage piece is, is really very very important to me. It's like, how do we help students take action under, condition of un, under conditions of uncertainty? And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, Chris, with the song and the lyrics. How can we help our students sing? So, but it's really hard sometimes to talk to students about the entrepreneurial mindset. It's not really definable. And for me, I don't like to say there's one mindset. What I really like to talk about are mind shifts. And that's starting with where the student is and if that student can move the needle just a little bit to thinking and acting more entrepreneurially, then I think we've done our job. And if you ask a student, are you thinking and acting more entrepreneurially? And they say, yes, I'm like, cool, great. You know, that tells me they're starting to develop the courage to take action. One of the exercises that I do, and we'll actually post after the webinar, is something called puzzles and stories. And it's an exercise where students can actually feel and experience the managerial mindset versus the entrepreneurial mindset. So I'll quickly describe, it's kind of complicated, but we'll post the teaching note. So you took, put students in groups, four or five at tables, you give them a jigsaw puzzle that they can complete rather quickly, like 35 pieces. And then the, the, the team who finishes first says, bingo, I'm finished. And we clap and we say, well, good job. We give them prizes. That's step one, okay? Step two, I have, I take, once I take all the puzzles away, I say, okay, the second phase of this exercise is I'm going to give you a blank sheet of flip chart paper and some markers. And as a group, you need to draw the most creative story you can inspired by the word, I don't know, pick a word, camera. And you only have 10 minutes to draw that story. Furthermore, you cannot talk as you draw this story. So then they do that and everyone shares their stories with the group. 
after they share their stories, we come back together and I ask one simple question. What did you prefer working on? The jigsaw puzzle or drawing the stories? And usually I get a 50-50 split, maybe 60-40. And I ask them why. And those that prefer the jigsaw puzzle, Chris, they talk about, oh, the goal was clear. We could get to work immediately. Uh, we knew um, who was going to do what part of the puzzle. We had a strategy, for example, starting on the edges first. We could measure our progress at any point. And we knew when we were done, you know, we, the, the person, the team that won, bam. On the other side, it's like, okay, why did you enjoy the stories? And they said something like, oh, it was much more creative. We could create whatever we want. We had starts and stops. We wanted to go one direction. We ended up going another direction. We had constraints of not being able to talk, but we worked around them and figured out new ways. And the possibilities of what we drew as a team were really bounded by our own imagination and what we were willing to put on the paper. So if you think about it, which one's entrepreneurial thinking, which one's managerial thinking, the managerial thinking is very much about the jigsaw puzzles and the entrepreneurial thinking is very much about drawing the stories. Of course, you have to explain that one is not necessarily better than the other, but we come to school already very good in the linear managerial problem solving. We're not so good on the uncertain and ambigu ambiguous side of drawing stories. So that's one way that I help students understand and feel what it's like to uh, think entrepreneurially. Oh, hi, that's great. You know, and I've, we've talked about the exercise. I've never done that in a large class, but just you talking about it, I get excited. I want to use it. Um, I, in terms of my large classes, Heidi, I hit entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset a little bit differently, maybe a little more tangently, but it's very important to the class. One way, and you know, I view an entre part of entrepreneurial mindset is, is viewing challenges as opportunities as opposed to something that's going to make you fail. Sure. And, I, and that relates to encouraging people to remove the mask. And I always tell people who participate, I say, you know, or thinking of participate, don't worry about these other people laughing at you because they're going to be working for you one day. You know, those who come out and participate, put yourselves out there. I mean, the, the number, to me, the first rule of success is putting yourself out there as an entrepreneurial, to having that entrepreneurial mindset. The second way I get an entrepreneurial mindset in my large classes is, is just tangentially. I require required reading in my class is the book that I co-authored uh, that Sage has uh, published on self-leadership. And it's pretty much a self-study. Students can read it. But to me, self-leadership, the process of leading yourself it is very, 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 very closely connected to entrepreneurial mindset and being able to overcome challenges, both using behaviors and, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, behaviors and your cognitions. So <clears throat> that's really how I do it. And I think it's, you know, the word entrepreneurial mindset, if, if you it, it have to describe my class, it, I don't use that word directly, but it, it fits. Well, it just shows you, and I think this is an important point to bring up, that the concept of entrepreneurship and especially entrepreneurial mindset, that is something that all students today need to develop, regardless of what class they're taking, regardless of what discipline they may be specializing in. I mean, I always talk about entrepreneurship as a life skill and they're like, well, what do you mean? Why do I need entrepreneurship? And I'm like, well, do you think it's important to navigate and excel under conditions of uncertainty? Yes. Do you think it's important to see the world in a different way so you're identifying other opportunities that other people aren't? Yes. Do you think it's important to have the courage to take action when you're really not sure if you're going to succeed or fail and also have the ability to say, if I do fail, I'm going to learn from that failure? And you actually want to fail because when you have information after you fail, that's information no one else has but you. They go, yes. You know, so it's all of these things that I love how entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial mindset is really crashing the boundaries of the doors of the business school, saying it's not just the discipline silo. All of our students need it. And almost shame on us if we don't use it and, 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 and really help students build the entrepreneurial mindset. Heidi, let me add to that real quickly. I think yeah. you, you, you hit a very important point. Anyone who's in the webinar that may be sitting in the webinar because they saw a promotion or an email about our introduction to business textbook that we just completed, 
uh, we we highlight the entrepreneurial mindset in the introduction to business in our introduction to business book because it's important to all aspects of business. But let's not be mistaken. That book is not an entrepreneurship book. It is a intro to business book. But to us, entrepreneurial mindset impacts every aspect of business. Um, and I just wanted to add that, Heidi. I think it's important. Yeah, you know, in the world of chat GPT, hoping, I'm hoping AI won't have an entrepreneurial mindset and that will be a human characteristic that we can celebrate in the future. Hey, Chris, um, I want to go to our fifth and, and final one, which I know you're a big advocate of. But before I do that, I've got a knock knock joke for you. Ready? Okay. Knock knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting cow. No. That's good. See? It's good. You're gonna use it. You're that's good. I I don't think Babs is worried they're gonna lose you to the, to the comedy tour, but that's it's it's good. Uh, <laughs> but Heidi, you are so well. Well, go ahead, Heidi. I. Well, no, I just know, I mean, that was kind of my segue to the last one being fun. Um, and I know you are a, you know, when we started to develop our list, you said it was fun. I said it was play. And I'm like, well, those are the same one and the same. So, and I know you're a huge advocate of bringing fun into the classroom. So how do you define it? How do you do it? What can we all learn from you? Oh, Heidi, I love this one. You know, I think I hope you all have seen through uh, Heidi, uh, Heidi and my interactions on this webinar is I like to make things fun. If not, why do it? Uh, maybe it's because I'm getting older and I don't want to waste time not having fun. And so that Heidi, my first when I'm creating a class, you know, uh, 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 whether it's a 50 minute class, an hour and 15 class period, or three hour class period. The first thing I ask myself, is this going to be fun for Chris Neck? Now, that may sound selfish, but if I'm not having fun, the students aren't going to have fun. And you may be asking, well, why does the students need to have fun? You know, in, throughout my career, I've had some, some naysayers that say, oh, Chris, you just entertain your students. And my response to that is, if you don't entertain your students, they're not going to learn. You're going to lose them. There's so many things asking for their attention. And so I just, I like to make the class a fun experience. Um, and it gets to that second point, Heidi, of organization of classroom culture. I want it to be, you know, a fun, a fun aspect to it. So let me tell you and the audience uh, some of the things I do for fun. Every year, I have what I call an official classroom sponsor. Well, what is that? Uh, I, it's, I, I reach out to a company. Well, actually, now over the years, they reach out to me, but I have a company. And usually it's a big recruiter on campus or the business school, and they are, will be a classroom sponsor. So this past year, it's uh, Mountainside Fitness. It's one of the largest privately owned gyms, uh, fitness centers uh, in the country, and they're stationed in, in Arizona. And they provide me with t-shirts, and I work with them on the design. They have their logo on the back. On the front, they have my class name, a class logo I've created, and um, you know it's a comfortable shirt. And they usually give me anywhere from a 500 to a thousand. And anytime a student says something interesting or participates in class or comes up to the front of the class for, for an exercise I'm doing, they get a t-shirt. If a student comes to me and says, hey, can I have a t-shirt? And they haven't done anything. I say, there's no free lunch. Come uh, do something in class to get one. That's number one. Number two, I believe in energy in the classroom. So I love sports. I'm a big sports fan. If those of you who go to sporting events, when the energy gets low, you probably notice they do the wave around the stadium. Well, I teach at large auditoriums. So if our energy gets low, I make the students do the wave. And if they don't, if I see someone not doing it, I make them do it by themselves and everyone gets a kick out of that. Hey, Chris, find who's your favorite football team? Uh, Louisiana State University, go Tigers, um, uh, uh, college football. Yes. Um, purple. I should have wore purple today, Heidi. Um, uh, and the, another thing that I do to illustrate points in class, I use a lot of different things. I'll use mu uh, movie clips from popular movies. I'll bring in bands, for example, to illustrate teamwork or uh, an orchestra to quartet to illustrate teamwork. Uh, I'll show mu uh, music videos. The key is, is try to, to use things to illustrate concepts that the students can relate to. Uh, try to make it fun. Does that mean the class is not rigorous? No, I require the students have to come to class and they have to do the work. But I don't think fun and learning are mutually exclusive. Uh, exclusive. And I know, how, and, and then I'll bring up uh, 
you know, that I brought with the, with the, the classroom culture thing, part of the fun. I, I like, I like po poetry and, and I hope the class thinks that's fun. Heidi, I know you believe in fun. I think you call it play. Why don't you tell us about what you mean by play? Yeah, I, you know, first of all, I want to comment on your energy comment because I, I don't want to, I don't want to leave this webinar not really digging deep a little bit on energy. Your students will model your behavior. If you walk into the classroom and you and your head are thinking they didn't read the chapter, they didn't analyze the case, or they didn't come to get prepared with the assignment, then they're not. But if you go in there into the classroom with the expectation of all this is done and just making that assumption, they will certainly get the idea that, look, Heidi's coming in and she's prepared. I need to come in and I'd be prepared. And my energy and enthusiasm will go a long way in making sure that they do that. And Chris, I've seen you in the classroom. And one thing that I've always been envious of is, you know, you've kind of, you're kind of one of those teachers where a student will go come away and go, damn, Chris Neck was fun. That was an awesome class, but he was tough. And that balance is magic, I think. And I think that's what we all want to do. But yes, I'm a big advocate of play in entrepreneurship education. I, you know, when I, I've done a little research in this area, and it's really interesting. I do gamify things quite a bit. I have students kind of vote with their feet, you know, creating four quadrants in the class and saying A, B, C, or D, and you got to run there. And then they have to tell me why they chose those things, you know, using music in the class, building games and out of the content. But for some reason, I think in higher ed, we've lost, we've never been able to say play is a vehicle to learning. I, you know, it's from the kindergartners, it's for the K through 12 space. But I do a lot of educating educators and I bring that play into my education seminars and they're like, oh my God, this is so awesome. And then I'm like, well, why aren't you bringing play into the classroom? Well, my students don't want that. They're expecting professional behavior. And I'm like, you were just super engaged in the session where it was completely based on play. And they're like, yes. I'm like, what makes you think your students feel differently from you? You're a middle-aged educator and you're enjoying the play why wouldn't a 17, 18, 19, 25, 26 year old MBA student not enjoy it? The average age, Chris, of a gamer today is 40 something years old. And it's not just for men, 46% oh, yeah. are women. So they're gaming and they're engaging in fun most of the time. And we wonder why they come to our classrooms and they're not watching us or participating because they're on their phones or doing something different. That's our fault. So I think the way we engage students today is through play. Um, you remember, hey, this is going to be an aside. Do you remember when we would convert the living room at our Valley Forge house in Baton Rouge with the blankets and we would like pretend like we had tools in a submarine? Yes. You know, Spaceship. why can't we do that as adults? We haven't done that in years, Chris. <laughs> yeah. I have to have to have to have to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Put a put a blanket over the desk. No. And it's a good point. Heidi, you know, I, a good litmus test for me, if, if I'm achieving my objective of having play and fun in the classroom and the students are responding is uh, two things. Cause I'm always say I'm, I'm uh, always fascinated when students bring their parents to class. Like they, like, you know, I don't know how many parents are out there, but you know, if, if your, your child invites you to a college class, you go, Ooh, that's, that's gotta be a pretty cool place. The other thing is I'm always saying, you asked my favorite football team, I said, LSU Tigers, go Tigers. And I'm always saying, go Tigers in class. I wear purple and gold on Thursdays of college football season. So when students bring me something LSU, I know, hey, it's, uh, I, I'm connecting. But play, you know, I said the, org the classroom culture was probably a foundation, but play and fun, you know, you just got to do it. Now you think from a yeah. teaching standpoint, I, 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 you know, I've been teaching for a long time. Uh, a lot of students, thir almost 30 years or a little over 30 years and 70,000 students. And if I've, I got to keep it fresh and I want it to be, if in, in making it fun is part of that, you know, it's a selfish reason, but it, it, it keeps me uh, uh, alert. It keeps me relevant and it keeps me up to date. And uh, I, I just think it's important. Sometimes I have nightmares. I, I go back to it. This happened in my doctoral program at the University of Colorado, like in the late 90s, 
we had one of a we had a premier entrepreneurship scholar come visit one of our seminars and he told a story about his student ratings and one of the students wrote and I won't tell you the guy's name I'll just call him Professor Smith one of the students wrote to Pro Professor Smith if I had one hour left to live I'd like to live it in Professor Smith's class because Professor Smith makes one hour seem like a lifetime you know, wow. I teach a I teach a three hour class, and sometimes students says, "Is it over?" I'm like, "Yes, that was a good class day." But we also have to admit, Chris, you know, it's easy to have one good class, and far more difficult to have a whole semester of really engaging and playful and relevant and fair and connected and inspired experiences. But we have to try. It's a journey. It's a journey. You know, there. I mean, let's let's be. I be. I mean, we're presenting this webinar and saying how great our classes are. But you know, there are days where I, you know, even with all of this and everything I try to do, I look into the audience and I feel like a stand-up comedian whose jokes aren't landing. It's like, <laughs> oh, and but you just and and I could. I, so I teach three classes back to back to back to back. I can have the first class and it's the same class, same material. And they, the it just connects and students are engaged and it's fun. In the very next class, it's just a dud. And you just, so it's, 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 you know, I, I kind of view it, it's a lot like, um, it's, it's a journey. You just, every day you, you just try and in every semester, uh, you know, Heidi, I think will agree with this. You're learning from your students. You're learning the process, you know, teaching is, a, is, a lifelong learning process as well from the teaching standpoint. And, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I, I just, it's, it's something that with these five elements, I think that we think this is what students want and, and that could change, uh, you know, but that's right now what we think. Okay, so Chris, before we turn it over to questions, I'm gonna put you on the spot because I haven't heard one in a while. So you said that you end every class with a poem? Every single class. All right, so can you, can you end? in our part of this webinar before we turn it over to questions with a poem. You know, Heidi, I, I can do that. And what I'll do is I'll, this is a, this is a poem that I saved for the very last class of the semester okay. to kick it off to say, hey, and, and, and another thing, oh, about the class culture, the last day of class, I tell my students, my office hours never end. Once you're in my class, office hours never end. So if you need something, if uh, you come to me and if I, if I can't get it for you, I, I probably know someone who can and, and people take me up on that. So Heidi, this, this is from uh, my book, Medicine for the Mind, Healing Words to Help You Soar. Um, it's out of print, but if anybody wants this poem, I can send it to you. It's called Leading the Band. And it goes just like this. She was going to be the president of the US of A. He was going to become an actor in a Broadway play. As youngsters, these were their dreams the visions they aspired to. They truly thought these aspirations eventually would one day come true. But you know what? She didn't become president. The reason is the ultimate sin. She never ran for office. She feared she would not win. He didn't make it to New York City. In fact, never set foot on the stage. He thought he'd forget his lines. In other words, he was afraid. The lesson in these stories is that you must get up and try. If you let your fears control you, your dreams will quickly die. Because if you want to hit that home run, you got to go up to the plate. If you want to meet that special person, you got to ask them for a date. The biggest crime in life is to forget what you have dreamt. It's not the act of losing, but to have never made the attempt. So as you battle with your fears in life, remember this brief command. If you're not afraid to face the music, you may one day lead the band there you go Heidi cool brother very very cool go. and Thank you know if you, you think about that poem it really relates to entrepreneurial mindset absolutely all right Sage we'll turn it back over to you I'm going to move on to this slide just so we have our books up in the background shameless plug for the books and it makes a really good Christmas gift makes a really good Christmas gift <laughs> yes well, we thank you some questions you're welcome Thank you so much for your presentations, Heidi and Chris. Really great information. Um, yeah, let's move into our Q&A session. Um, that question and answer function um, has been open. So we have a few questions in there already, but please continue to add to the list. Um, so one of the first questions over here, Heidi and Chris, was about 
your first relevance topic. Um, can you cover relevance by bringing news of the day connected to the class topic of the day? Oh, absolutely. And sometimes I would say have this, sometimes I'll give extra participation if the students bring it in. It's one thing for us to bring it in, but we're also older. Sometimes the relevance of what, the, or sometimes what students find relevant and connected to the content is really interesting. That's a great point. If I was a smaller class, I would have, you know, uh, bonus points for so, or, or even part of the class, part of their class grade, where if they brought in things or have to write about part of a journal where they're writing about a, a news event and how it relates to the class in some kind of way. I love that idea. Love it. I actually might even borrow from it uh, and use it in some kind of way. I love it. Perfect. Um, so sending something daily or frequently is something I've tried, but students usually don't like to read. How do you go around that? Can well, you, it's can a text. Can you repeat the first part of the question again? Uh, sending something daily or frequently. Oh, so it's it's a text. Um, it's on a WhatsApp group. All the students are... <laughs> sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, all the students are on the WhatsApp group. So it's a line. It's, you know, go talk to a stranger today. It is a, you know, a quote by Maya Angelou. So it's something very short. And they just take it, just like you would take a vitamin every day. Awesome. Heidi and Chris, can you talk about how you brought these elements to your classes when teaching online during the pandemic? Chris, you want to start on that one? I will. The pan, I'll, I'll have to admit it was a challenge for me. Before the pandemic, I had never taught online courses. And uh, it was a challenge initially, but by the end of the pandemic, I, I was a believer. Um, in terms of being able to accomplish some of these these things uh, online. Now, uh, when I was teaching online, it was I was live, so you know it wasn't I was taped something and then people see it. So I could do a lot of the same things in terms of creating relevance, in terms of creating a classroom culture, um, and but I, I had to work a little bit more harder with the communication. So with like Heidi texting people. You know, I was really using Canvas to to reach out to them frequently throughout the week, just to make stay connected. And I and I would held a, a number of special uh, Zoom office hours just for people to pop in if they wanted to pop in. Uh, I found that helpful, but it was definitely a challenge. Heidi, oh, Heidi, you're on mute. mute. <laughs> Didn't want the dogs. That that's where my mindset vitamin started was during COVID. So I would have a daily connection with the students. And again, my sessions were live as well. And it, it was hard, but I would do things like have, uh, um, you know, wear your favorite, wear a t-shirt that has an entrepreneurship slogan on it. And so we all share the t-shirts. And if they didn't have a t-shirt, they would put it on a piece of paper and tape it to a shirt. So little things that would promote play or going into breakouts and coming back quickly, you know, don't send people into breakouts for 20 minutes, you send them into breakouts for five to six minutes, come back, send them back out, come back. So, you know, they don't have time to necessarily go and do other things, but it's not ideal. It is not ideal. Uh, Jen, yeah, uh, I'll comment. I, I was scanning at the questions. I seen a bunch just to hold it. Uh, people are asking about the poem, oh. believe it or not. Uh, I wrote that poem. Uh, and it's in a book that I wrote, but is no longer in print. Um, uh, and I can send anybody a copy of that poem. Uh, maybe you guys can post my email address on follow up. Uh, I'd be happy to send it to anybody who wants it. Or, we'll or I can send sharing the recording and and a bunch of the materials that you all referenced um, in our okay, follow up. So I'll, send, I'll send Sage the poem, and you can Perfect. give it to people. Okay. Perfect. Um, and so we have another question. How do you adjust your five principles as you switch between undergraduate and graduate students? Um, I, on the fairness side, I have little tolerance as an MBA student for going, for asking for anything that's not in the syllabus. So I'm very disciplined with the MBA students as it's a little bit more lenient with the undergraduate students. But again, I'm teaching a, a smaller class. But other than that, I play just as much. Um, I try to engage just as much. So I uh, do not teach in the graduate level uh, here currently right now, but I do a plethora of executive development. 
So deal with business people, executives, teaching them a lot of the same principles I teach in my classes. And I don't adjust much, you know? I find that uh, the only thing, I have to work a little bit harder to create the culture uh, because older people don't wanna jump in and has fun as much as my eight, you know, typical 18 to 22 year old student. Not, that's not all of them, but typically the, the age range. But I, I, you know, the number one rule of speaking is know your audience. And, you know, you just can't see who, who is the audience, but the principles pretty much all apply because these principles are basically who Heidi and I are. And fortunately that's what the students want. Um, and to not, to not do that would be inauthentic. And I think the worst thing as a teacher you can do is not be yourself. And if you get anything from this webinar is don't try to be Heidi Neck or Chris Neck, be yourself, you know, apply these, what we talk about, but do it in your own way with your own polish. And just for the record, the, the stories and puzzles exercise, I've done that with executives all around the world. So See, there you go. There you go. So we have a question. Can you provide any strategies for how you would go about integrating these five elements into a standardized curriculum that's shared amongst adjuncts or new faculty? You know, I, Chris, you want to take that one first? Or you want me to go? Uh, that I'll, I'll jump in, give you time to think about it. Um, okay. um, I, that's a great question. Uh, because what you're talking about is standard standardization across sections. And, you know, I, I believe in standardization across sections, but I don't believe that that re restricts the individual instructor from being who they are, putting their own spin on things. And so, I mean, just thinking it out loud, I, I, I would say, you know, a webinar such as this, where these principles are outlined and, and these are some ways that you can enact them in the classroom would be helpful um, so that people can build and choose from what they want. But I, you know, I don't, I don't think you want to make it a cookie cutter approach because I think that takes away from the, the individual instructor, but just being aware of these, you know, if I, when I first started teaching, if someone would have if I would have sat through a workshop where someone talked about these five elements, it would have really reduced my learning curve and made my classes a better place earlier on in my career than, than what I think they are now. Heidi? You know, I think a, a standardized curriculum doesn't mean that you don't have room for a two minute tweak here and there, throwing up a challenge on the board or getting the students vote in a different way or vote with their feet. Or, you know, so I think the content is standardized. I do question, is the how standardized? And sometimes I worry when the content and the how is standardized, because then you're just having robots as teachers. So you need to let their individual talents shine as long as they're delivering the content that needs to be delivered. Yeah, I mean, I view the music analogy. You give everyone the same uh, song. So everyone the same song to play, but they each use their individual instrument to play it. And, um, you know, give, I think making professors and instructors and teachers aware of these five elements, then they can, you know, ad lib the way they want to, to make it come to life. Okay. Uh, do you have, uh, do you use any simulations with your classes? If yes, how? I'll let Heidi answer that because I know she does. I'm currently not using simulations. Yeah, so again, I teach entrepreneurship classes. I use, um, I've used two simulations. One is called Venture Blocks. It's actually bundled with our entrepreneurship textbook. And that is a simul, and it's also, you can, it's separate. It's not necessarily just Sage. And Venture Blocks teaches students how to interview customers in emerging markets in order to identify their needs and create solutions to their needs. So it really helps students practice interviewing before they actually have to go out and do um, customer development interviews. And that will make sense if you're teaching entrepreneurship. The second simulation that I've used is off of Harvard's website called the Food Truck Challenge. And that helps students um, take action before planning and understand the importance of prototyping and experimentation. And then just as a, a future plug, the puzzles and the stories. I'm actually working on a simulation right now, computer-based simulation that will do that. And hopefully that'll be ready by the, the summer. Great. 
So as instructors that primarily teach entrepreneurship and principles of management, why did you decide to write an introduction to business textbook? Well, that's a good question. Chris, do you want me to start or do you want to start? You go ahead, Heidi. I've got my thoughts, but um, since you're younger, well, go ahead. When Chris and I came together and when Sage asked, because we had the entrepreneurship text and Chris obviously has other texts. And when Sage came and said, well, you do an introduction to business text, Chris and I and our other our third author, Emma, came together and like, we'll only do it if we can do something that's more meaningful to the marketplace and more meaningful to the students and relevant and modern and entrepreneurial, not an entrepreneurship course. And so I think we've done that. I think we've curated a really kind of modern introduction to business that is not about business and society, but about placing the student in the organization. And it takes the best of kind of my work on entrepreneurial mindset, Chris's work in organizational behavior, and really what students are craving today is understanding that business can exist to do good in the world, as well as make a profit. And so every example, just about every example in the book, especially the end of chapter cases and the opening stories are all about ventures of all sizes and of all tenure um, that connect to one or more of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's subtle. So it shows students that it's the businesses the students are buying from. It's those businesses that are doing good and doing well at the same time. And that we can't ignore the role of business in preserving the future um, of the earth and also for future generations. Yeah, I'll, and I will just add um, the, um, the chance to write a book that really builds upon our individual strengths because the, and to really, you know, I have so many students in my, my principles of management course is the first course that they take in the college of business. And I have so many students that, you know, if, if they're asking questions, even broad than principles of management that are business related. And I was just thinking, gosh, you know, that has to be not just Arizona State University. So if we could write a book for students in intro to business courses that would address those issues that Heidi brought up and, uh, you know, any chance to work with my sister, I'll, I'll take advantage of as well. So it was a good opportunity. I wanted to bring up too any of our books, anyone in the webinar, you know, like, like I tell my students, my office hours never in. You attend one of our webinars, our office hours never in. If there's any questions you have about any of those books, about how you can use them in the class, and especially our new introduction to business book, you know, reach out to Heidi or I. We're, that's why we wrote the book, because if you don't use them in your classes, it's, that's, you know, it's just sitting on a shelf somewhere. And I don't say that like, let's do lunch. I, I really mean that. Not that I wouldn't want to go to lunch with you, but I don't eat lunch. Um, uh, we'd, we'd love to help you. Thank I you. I just want to address, before we go, Jen, I just want to address Jorge's comment about just trying to play devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. Why intro to business courses important? Aren't you covering topics in multiple courses? I would say, yes, a lot of these topics are definitely covered in depth in multiple courses. But as I travel around the country and the world, I'm seeing a lot more colleges and universities requiring um, every student to take some type of business course. So if we only get one shot at a student, I hope they, they take our book. Um, if you had thread a business school and you have all of these different courses, then maybe the intro to business isn't necessary. I also think we wait too late to inculcate business and the principles of the entrepreneurial mindset and all the basics too late. So um, I'm hoping that this will travel outside the business schools into more general curriculum because business is a necessary, you know, skill. Jen, real quick, because I, I want people, um, how do you get students to come to time on class? You just set the culture day one, be here on time. And when, in, in, when people come in late the first couple of times, stop the class and say, hey, sorry, you're late, but we really need to get here on time. And with a large class, it's easy because it puts pressure, peer pressure, you know, coming in. I mean, not to embarrass them. And, and the other thing is, uh, I just say day one, no laptops. You can take notes on a piece of paper. And, you know, if, if you, that's how we do it in here. I don't ban cell phones, uh, if, and, but that's it. That's the only electronics they can have. And I've maybe had out of 70,000 students in my career, two people complain at least to me. 
So. Wonderful. I see we've reached the end of our time today. I want to thank Heidi and Chris again so much. Um, thanks to everyone for joining today's Sage Talk. Please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view this entire webinar on our website. Um, and that email will also include links to more information on our speakers' Sage texts, inclu including the brand new Introduction to Business, as well as Entrepreneurship, Principles of Management, Organizational Behavior, and Self-Leadership. Um, their intro books are also available in Sage Vantage, which is our inclusive, uh, our intuitive digital platform that offers auto-graded assignments and interactive multimedia tools. Um, so re they really help students to better prepare for their business classes and information on how instructors can order a free review copy of any of those texts will be included in our follow-up email along with some of those activities and Chris's poem. Um, so thanks again for your attention. We hope to to see you again at another Sage Talk webinar again soon. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.